Hello and welcome to the Ask the Industry Podcast, episode 106. I'm comedian Simon Kane, and for those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio, and today, TV production. John Plowman, OBE, is a television and film producer who has been producing some of the most iconic comedic TV shows at the BBC for the last 30 odd years. He's worked on shows including A Little Bit of Fry and Laurie, Ab Fab, The Vicar of Dibley, Gimme Gimme Gimme, Psychoville, Little Britain, and so many more. I got him on to talk about the history of comedy at the BBC, how to get your show noticed, what the BBC is currently looking for, how technological changes are impacting the BBC internally, and how he goes about scouting for new acts, talent, and ideas. If you'd like to know more about John, he actually has a new book out called How to Produce Comedy Bronze. There's a link in the show notes. It's a fabulous book all about the writing process and about his career, and it's full of stories and advice. If you click the link in the description, it'll take you straight to the Amazon page. It's an affiliate link, so I get about 10p per every book. Full disclosure on that one. Uh, it doesn't cost you any more, though. So if you want to support the show, press that button, and you can help me and John out. I'm going to say much more because this episode is jam-packed with information, and I just want to get straight into it. But what I will say is, if you're new here, please do hit the subscribe button. If you're old here, please do consider giving us an honest, ideally positive review in iTunes. And either way, please consider joining the Facebook group. It's called Ask the Industry Podcast, and it's on Facebook, obviously. It's the best place to ask your questions to future guests before we do the recording. But for now, without any more delays... This is John Plowman. No, obviously I'm a frustrated millionaire and and a, and a hugely frustrated comedian. Uh, not actually neither of those things is. Yeah, no. Look, I think the joy of being a producer, as opposed to being a performer, is that you can tell the performers what to do, uh, <laughs> or rather that you can tell them, no, we cannot spend any more money on that. No, we cannot spend any more time on that. Uh, and and I don't know. Maybe it's just you're allowed a certain amount of megalomania. So you like the control rather than the creativity. Uh, I'm I'm. I hope I don't like the control. What I like is the creative to creativity. And I think what I like is that you start with not very much and you end up with something good if you're lucky, and that that process is the interesting one when we I'm when we did absolutely fabulous which is in a way probably the thing I'm best known for although I may be not known at all and I may be <laughs> deluding myself completely anyway when we did that uh, there would be beginnings of, re- of rehearsal weeks that began with uh, first draft and in small typing at the bottom of the page, and I have a copy of this, it says, don't worry, no jokes as yet. <laughs> <laughs> and and the going from no jokes as yet to, a, that was Sunday, and on the following Friday night to have a lot of people laughing, seems to me great. That That's a lot of fun, it seems to me. So when you, so let's start with Ab- Absolutely Fabulous then. When you first saw the two of them performing together. I presume it was live? When I first... Well, the history of Ab Fab goes very quickly and roughly like this. Uh, Dawn and Jennifer did a sketch which was called Modern Modern Mother and Daughter, which was Jennifer as a character called Bettina complaining to her daughter, played by Dawn French, who was, as it were, upstairs doing uh, her homework. Uh, that Dawn uh, complaining firstly that she was having a party downstairs and why couldn't Dawn come down to it so in other words it's a sort of generational reversal thing Um, and also complaining that uh, Dawn wants to go to university Uh, and there is a memorable line where did you say you were going darling Aberdeen mum Aberdeen Abba bloody Dean. I don't know anybody in Abba bloody Dean. And it's kind of wonderfully, it's a wonderful example of somebody being entirely out for themselves and nobody else. You know, it doesn't matter about your university education. What about my social life? Uh, (laughs) And and when you come downstairs, could you apologize and tell everybody you're on a diet? Even if it, (laughs) you know, just horrible. Anyway, so we did that sketch. And then... And then 
there was a gap and Dawn and Len adopted Billy and that sort of took quite a long time. Billy is their daughter. And as a result, Jennifer didn't have much to do and thought, I know what I'll do, I'll write a sitcom. And so the first I knew of it, well, there are two bits of first I knew of it. One was when Jennifer's agent rang me up and said, hello, John, it's Maureen. Um, now, you, you, your guess is as good as mine as to whether this will lead it to anything, but Jennifer's written a sitcom. Oh, actually, I think she said Jennifer's writing a sitcom. And then the next thing was an exercise book arrived with the first episode in pencil. Uh, and that was the first I knew of it. And, and, and it was extraordinary, not extraordinary as in, oh, hooray, it's a, it's a genius of laughter from beginning to end. It was just that I, I didn't quite get it. I don't mean I didn't get the joke, because it was wonderfully savage and having a good go at the what one might describe as the vacuousness of people who work in in pr and who pr things as jennifer says at one point it was also that it was a world where i just wasn't sure and this is my problem not hers i just wasn't sure whether jennifer whether this was a world jennifer had entirely constructed or whether it was real now once we started doing the show, particularly once Joanna came on board, we knew, sure as hell, that it was that it was a real world. As it were, you know, that the, the world of fashion PR is a genuinely uh, is a is a genuine thing. And what was remarkable, particularly, you know, having sat in rehearsals with Jennifer, in vain and. A, the rest of us really inveighing against these people and saying look she doesn't look after her daughter very well she doesn't really do a jo- day's work she you know she's an idle uh self-loving anyway so what happened then was the the first people who jumped up and down and said this is wonderful we love you were exactly the fashion pr people Oh my God, you noticed how vacuous we are. Well, no, they didn't say that. But, oh my, you know, you've noticed our world, how wonderful. And, and that tells you something about the human condition. I'm not sure what, but, but it, you know, that, that says something. That, that when you savagely indict people, they go, oh, hooray, thank you for savagely indicting me. I'm, it means you've noticed. Yeah, I, from my experience of live work is groups of people actually like the jokes about their group of people, yes, generally of course. speaking. Yeah, and no, so that, that's right, but it's slightly different. It's maybe slightly different to say, we're doing a joke about your job, isn't that funny, don't you enjoy that more than a joke about somebody else's job? And to say, your job is pointless. <laughs> I'm sure they know. And you look after your children bad. That was what was <laughs> remarkable. Uh, almost within two or three episodes, people were claiming, that the Daily Mail claimed that they absolutely knew who the models for uh, Edina and Patsy were. Uh, I think Patsy was Janet Street Porter. I can't remember who Eddie was. But, but then um, a woman popped up and said, no, 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 I'm Eddie. Uh, a PR lady who'd done PR for for Dawn and Jen. She so, oh no, uh, sorry. She's PRing herself there. She was yeah. Like, I just want my yeah. name. Oh, it's me. It's yeah. me. It's me. Oh, I see. So you're the person who's admitting, as soon as possible, that you don't look after your daughter. You don't do a day, good day's work in your life. Uh, you're entirely idle and pleasure loving. It seems to me bizarre. You know, why why not crawl away into a corner and hope nobody ever notices? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> So when you when you read the script, w- w- let's let's put a date on it. So it was around w- when was the script? Uh, done? Uh, we did the first episode in nineteen ninety one, I think. So it would have been maybe a year or two before yeah, that. Yeah, no, six months. Yeah. So well, that maybe a year. No, that's another right. question Sorry, to it. Who cares? Well, no. I so I'm thinking if it was nineteen ninety. Yeah. There wasn't as much. I mean, there were great sitcoms then, but I feel like there's been a boom. In the last kind kind of years, especially on American TV shows, of, of just sitcoms I, getting. No, go on. It's interesting, isn't it? I've I've just written this book, and one of the complaints that I make in it is that 
is that there isn't as much comedy on television as there used to be. I looked back at the Radio Times for 1993, I think it was, maybe, you know, around that time. And between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock, most nights of the week, Monday to Friday, there were two comedies. Now, they may not have been very good comedy, <laughs> but they were uh, there they were on BBC One, 8 o'clock till 8.30, 8.30 till 9. And that's, even if they're terrible, that's good because it means, A, writers are getting good practice at writing sitcoms, and B, actors are getting good practice at being in sitcoms. And now there are far fewer. And, and there's a sort of feeling of, oh, well... It'll be okay because comedy is on BBC Three or ITV Two, and where actually on ITV Two particularly, it's bought in Lockstock and and Barrel from Family Guy. You know, it 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 just seems to me not a good, not as good a place now as it was then, just in terms of keeping comedy alive. Is that, is that and also not enough money spent on it. Sorry, carry no, on. No, no, I agree. Carry with on. That. I agree with that part. <laughs> um, but is that because? So I've had a few commissioners on before, especially um, Ian Coyle from Dave was very open and upfront about being an ad man more than a commissioner because if he can't sell an ad on a program, as he's not a you know like the BBC the public broadcaster, he can't really validate making the show. So I wonder whether it's a case of um, yes, 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 it's confusing. Yeah. The Dave. Bill, Fred, you know, there are lots of channels, some of which are just pure repeat. Yeah, yeah, of course. And UK TV uh, Gold, which is UK part TV of well. Gold, yeah. from which one gets absolutely no money. Mm. And, that's, and that's maybe, some might say, as it should be. They oh, so should you be don't allowed get syndication to. money from that? Sorry. No, that's all right. No, no, it's interesting. No, because that's another thing we're gonna, I was going to talk about later, so I'll bring that up in a sec. But my, my question was going to be whether, A, you're finding commissioners are being more let's say, uh, cautious about what they take chances on, uh, and especially new writers, because uh, I feel like on the circuit, there's a big, especially as I'm about to go to Edinburgh, there's a big push for finding the newest person, which is kind of code for the youngest. There's a, well, no, all I would say is that every year there is what I've always thought of as a sort of Edinburgh bubble. Yeah. There is a thing that develops and everybody says, oh my God, you've got to see him. And why isn't he on the telly? Well, the answer is because he's actually only got half an hour. He does that half an hour brilliantly or hour. Uh, and, and he's worked at it and he will have a career. It just may not be tomorrow. Um, and Edinburgh kind of produces that feeling. And speaking entirely selfishly i would rather there were an edinburgh bubble about ideas and about writers than necessarily than about stand-up comedians but i can't have that because people don't go and pay uh, to sit and watch writers write and rightly so well there, there's been for example league of gentlemen which is some people you've worked with a lot um who That's started true. and indeed i still am working with you are, you are still working with they've them still, inside number they've nine. tolerated me this far <laughs> Well, they, they obviously were doing the Edinburgh Fringe. And did you, did you see them up there? I'm wondering... I saw them in the Pleasant's Attic. Now, the Pleasant's Attic, although I wasn't in uh, India when it was ruled by the British, uh, I can imagine that the Black Hole of Calcutta was something like the Pleasant's Attic. It was so hot. It was... So it was hot and dark and dense, and on came these uh, three guys, although they turned out in the end to be four of them, the, these three guys in dinner jackets. Uh, and the th thing I remember particularly was, was a tall one uh, telling a story about uh, exploring in a cave, which gradually uh, uh, becomes uh, a, something about the death of a child in a cave and maybe this person being responsible, I mean, this person being responsible. It's a very good piece of writing and indeed there were lots of other pieces of writing and there was, uh, you know, Edward and Tubbs and, and lots of the other characters, uh, I think including Papa Lazaru, but forgive me if he wasn't there. Uh, and it was like a wife of mine. And they were the, that year's bubble, but rightly so. Well, no, that's not fair. I mean, I'm sure rightly so for everybody else who's ever been a bubble. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm wondering when you saw them live doing an hour, did you think, 
I can turn that into half an hour for TV. I tell you what happened was a pro- one of the, a, a, a producer, a radio producer. I think she was a radio producer then. Had said, look, we must do something. With, come and see these guys because they're really good, and I think I know what I can do. And obviously, if you're if you're uh, running a comedy department in some shape or form, what you adore is somebody coming up and saying, "I've got an idea, and we'll do it this way." Because then you don't have to go through that thing of, "Well, how, you know, could we do it like this? Should we do it like that? Will it work?" Maybe she wanted to do a thing with the league. That was, and and Sarah did actually say this. It, it'll be a bit like the Archers. Um, it was the notion that the sketches would take place all in the same village, which in the initial series on radio was called Spent, and then when they found out the real name of Roy Chubby Brown uh, was called Royston Basie, and and so she and she was a very good producer, had an idea of what the end product was going to be, you know. So so the joy was seeing some new people and thinking, yes, I can absolutely see how to, how we're going to do that, and it'll be great. So it was like creating a vehicle for them. So you were like taking what they were doing already and putting it... Cause well, I think what you, what you always hope to do is to find a way of use, uh, using comedy sounds stupid, but... but to find something that fits the comedy that's being done. Does that make sense? In other words, you know, the probably the first version of this is the Lucy show. Lucille Ball was a wonderful, energetic, uh, madcap, slapstick, uh, brilliant, red-headed American comedian. She didn't have her own show. They found a show which was about her and her husband and her best friend. And and suddenly that sort of works. You know, you believe the relationships. You believe it, it, it generates gags. You need a form. Maybe that's really all I'm saying, that it's good to find a form that fits the material. I feel, uh, I mean, I'm, and I might be wrong uh, just looking at your back catalogue. I feel like a lot of the shows are kind of... Um, Star, not star led, but like if you removed, for example, League and tried to put in another sketch group, it wouldn't work. So you've so you've made a world, or or you've developed a world with them that would only work with them. And I feel like that's the same with all of the sketch shows that you've worked through. Uh, worked through is it? Um, sorry. Um, what I I'd, I'd put it the other way around and say okay. that it's quite difficult, not impossible, and I hope I've done it from time to time. It's quite difficult to get show, to persuade channel controllers to give you the money to make a series without uh, stars. In other words, they prefer the idea of a show that has some people that the audience know in it. And I think, to a certain extent, the audience do. Mm. Now, there are exceptions, and curiously, the league were, a, were an exception. But the joy was, the idea was jolly strong, and you could immediately sort of see what it was. Has, has that become more the case like in your career? Like, has it become more that they're only looking for stars? Because again, that's No, I don't... I think it's just... It totters along. You know, we did... Uh, and, and you always have to... Sorry, I've, I'm thinking and trying to talk at the same time. Um, it, it's, you know, sometimes you have to ask yourself, why are people stars? It's not just because somebody came along and paid them a lot of money and gave them a nice house and got them on the, you know, into the into the tabloids. It's because they're good. So the reason Dawn French was cast in the Vicar of Dibley was because she was good and she was right for the part. And indeed, I I remember during the early days of rehearsing that show, Richard Curtis and to a certain extent me, but more Richard, saying to Dawn. Uh, never forget we've got a list uh, uh you know which was essentially we've got a list of other people who could play the part it wasn't it wasn't sort of it didn't start off as a you know what can i write for dawn french it started off as what can i write about this ludicrous idea that it's tough for women to be vicars you know that that's so so sometimes people work because they're good you know when i worked with Mel Smith and Griffiths Jones, it wasn't just that they were stars, 
I mean, in fact, I say just, it sh I shouldn't say that at all. It wasn't that they were stars, it's that they were very good sketch comics. So, yeah, because from an outsider perspective, it looks the other way around, so I can I, understand. Cool, I know, I know, and it shouldn't. And the only bit of it that sort of does is when you walk into a controller's office and you say, good news, I got you another series with whoever it might be, and they've heard of whoever it might be, and they go, oh, hooray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I won't have to worry about the, whether that show will work. But I would say, and I don't mean this to denigrate anybody else, but, but in a way, the shows that I'm personally proudest of are the shows where we started with almost nothing, or, or rather or not a big star base, where, where the show becomes the star. You know, there was a show we did, a while ago called Beautiful People and Beautiful People came, oh, two, we did two series it was written by Jonathan Harvey and it came about in the way that shows are supposed to but never do uh, I read a book I read a book and I rather liked it and I bought The Rise or oh, the BBC bought The Rise I personally didn't but, um, we bought The Rise and it was set in it, it, it was sorry it was about a man called Simon Doonan. Simon Doonan was born and brought up in Reading, God help him, uh, and then relatively soon went and worked in New York and became the creative director of Barney's Department Store. Now, Barney's Department Store is a sort of big fashionable store. Now I'm going to get this wrong, but it's in the middle of New York. Uh, sorry, I yes. can't exactly remember where it is. Anyway, Simon small boy from Reading grows up, becomes a fashionable thing, because he sort of wanted to go and live with the beautiful people. And, and Anyway, read this book, thought it was jolly good, bought the rights, and thought that the person who should write it was Jonathan Harvey, because Jonathan, I'd been working with Jonathan on a show called Gimme, 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 and uh, which incidentally was the only show I've ever worked on where we had to turn down the laughter where I went into the sound department and said could you bring the level of the laughter down and the actors up because anyway um, for the best of reasons um, sorry so bought the book went to see Simon and with Jonathan who I Jonathan had written give me give me and and I persuaded and indeed he didn't take much persuasion uh, that he should write this, but that we should also change it. We should change it, it was set in originally in the 1960s, and a cynic would say, I thought that'll be expensive. But uh, a, a creative person, such as I was, would also say, it'll sort of, it'll make more contact with the audience if it doesn't feel like you're forever thinking, oh, look at those, I don't know, look at those loon pads, if you're just thinking about... Anyway, cut a long story short, we, uh, Jonathan wrote it, it was really good, uh, and we cast a relatively unknown cast, Olivia Coleman was in it, and I remember the casting director at the time saying, get her while you can, uh, and now she's queen, mm. you know, th is there no end? Yeah. So, so in a way, that show had was entirely unknowns, and it's the only show I've ever done, with the exception of the film, that had a soundtrack album. Uh, and in a way, I'm pathetically proud of a soundtrack album, which includes an ABBA track sung by Kylie Minogue and Danny Minogue. Not saying they were in the same studio at the same time, but uh, they did sing together. Sorry, that's, all that's right. a diversion. No, that's What's fine. a diversion from? Stars, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me stars usually are stars because they're good, and you want good people in your show. Mm. But I, I'm wondering, because there's, there's a lot of people who have come up with you and through your career that you've, yeah. you've started working... No? I'm saying that in a slightly different I. Uh, yes, all right, yes. You've got to remember, from my, from my perspective, the shows that I've watched... Brenton Saunders, you, I, yeah, yeah, I'd all, say. All of the, all the, well, a, a lot of the shows that you've, you've made, I've come up through, because it's, it's sort of been 19s and, you know, 90s and, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. so from my perspective, it looks like the shows are pushing the careers forward of those people. I guess they're doing both, you know, but yeah. you, you, you try... 
Um, sorry, you try always to get the best people you can, and you try always to try and make the show the best that it can be. Um, and if that means that somebody who a few of the audience know uh, on episode one and all the audience know by episode six, you kind of go, well, that's great. We've done our job. Um, but so, so is, the, is it the byproduct or is it the result that someone who maybe is unknown would become famous? It doesn't always happen. Mm. But quite a lot of times it does. If you put somebody in a leading part, in a show that makes people laugh, and enough people watch it, and that's maybe the crucial thing, or at least watch it over time, then the person who, whoever the person is, will become a star. And sometimes people feel like stars even when they're not. So when Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant came into my office, and said, we've got this thing called The Office. Neither of them were, were, were known. I mean, Stephen had just done a BBC training course, who cares? And Ricky had worked in the music industry. But, but they had the confidence and an aura that, that it was, as it were, they felt, we've already won the Emmys, thank you, even though we haven't made the show yet. Uh, you know, you just, there are people who just have that. Mm. And did that... Was that nice or was that annoying? Because I imagine <laughs> sort of an arrogant twin people who like have no oh, CV in an industry going, we've got no, this thing. Where's well, the budget? I'm, be, I'm talking really more about aura than actuality. Okay. In other words, they came in, they were two people, mostly... Did not you invite really them in? Quite. They, uh, how did that work? I think I invited them in. Because was this in the days when... <laughs> They, might just, again, didn't, might just they didn't just wander confident. in off the corridor. Well, no, because it was a time where you there was like open writers. Room well, you BBC, try. So yeah, but but that normally, if you want somebody to make a show or to come to to go to a controller and say, please give us two hundred fifty thousand pounds an episode, usually they make an appointment. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say. Seems reasonable. Uh, yeah, it does, yeah, really. Does, doesn't it? So what, what's the difference for you, like the main differences in trying to pitch shows or pitch ideas even in a public broadcast to maybe a commercial vehicle? Did, did you have much to do with BBC Studios, for example, like that sort of commercial wing of it? A little bit, and I've also worked for ITV. Mm. Um, and curiously, I'd say the BBC... I mean, I started at Granada, uh, which was part of ITV at the time. Mm. And I'd say the shock was that when I worked at Granada, nobody really cared about ratings or how shows did. And when I got to the BBC, which you would have thought would absolutely be the people who didn't care because they were public subsidised and mm. the whole lot, they were the people who did. Mm. But, but that just may have been my experience and accident and all the rest of it. Um, sorry, what was your question? Well, uh, uh, can I interrupt you for a yeah. second? Because uh, clearly there's more content than ever now. And there's more pull factors for your eyeballs and your ears. But so curiously, there is less prime time comedy. And that, I, w that, I, I mean, no, that's know, a, this that, is me having a moan. But I can't, I, I'm not sh entirely convinced that the great British public has decided that it doesn't want to laugh as much as it did. <laughs> now, what the broadcasters have decided is that drama is king and that drama should get a lot more money than comedy. And they've also decided that um, comedy is risky and therefore you put it on small channels where it just might push through. But of course, it's harder to push through on a small channel than it is on a larger channel. You know, the f uh, this isn't nostalgia, I promise. Well, it probably is. But when the first night, the first episode of Absolutely Fabulous on BBC Two got 7.7 .7 million on a Thursday at nine o'clock. Who cares? Um, now, if you get a million now on BBC Two, you're thrilled and you think you're doing okay. And indeed, if you ever got 7.7 .7 million, certainly during the week, for a new comedy on BBC One, you'd be, you know, balloons would be being blown up. So, it, 
the landscape has changed. And the landscape has changed, I think, to the detriment of allowing people to laugh. But do you think that's down to the taste of the certain commissioners that are in place now? Or do you think they're listening to audiences and, and maybe it's a case of they, they actually do want drama at that time. I mean, I would prefer it if they had more comedy, if I'm honest with you, just from a selfish point of view, both career-wise and personally. But I, I'm playing devil's advocate on this right now because their job are on the line, so they obviously want to produce the best thing that will pull the most eyeballs. I think what I'd say, and I have no... I mean, look, there's obviously an element of truth in what you say. A controller's job is to keep the job as long as they want it and not to be fired because ratings are terrible. I can see that. And I can see... <laughs> as long as we're that. agreed on that one. <laughs> yeah. And I can see... Was that what you were trying to do when you were... Con- yeah, yeah, I okay, was good. trying to get fired. And I can see <laughs> that if you... I can see that that it that comedy is risky, and comedy by and large is riskier than drama, because what drama does is it tells a story. And if I sit down and I tell you a story, I've got that ambition, and if you get to the end and you find out who married who, or who killed who, or why, then you're happy. Mm. If I say, I'm now gonna tell you a very, very funny story, and you're going to laugh a lot, and you don't, you feel terribly disappointed. Mind you, I don't feel too good, but you feel very disappointed. And and so I think I'd say that comedy is harder. I mean, you know, there'll be a lot of drama people who will say, you should be so lucky. Um, and and they'll be right to say it, but, but somehow I, I, I think, I think, well, okay, I think maybe drama is easier and the comedy, because there is less comedy, there has been less chance for comedy to grow. And comedy takes more time to grow than drama. If I start a a series in which somebody gets murdered and somebody walks into the room and says, now what's been going on here? They're clearly a policeman. You haven't got too much. You know, and, and if by the end of the hour or the end of the six hours they find out who did it, that's great. But it took more than three series for Only Fools and Horses to mm. be a hit. You know, it just takes a while mm. for the audience to get to know the characters, for the audience to sort of enter the world of the show, for the, uh, you know, the... There's, there's, Emotional investment. Uh, emotional investment, but also even, you know, something as boring as repetition, you might mm-hmm. say. You might say, if you see Del Boy screw up something two or three times, you might think, oh, lovely, he's going to screw something else up. Mm-hmm. You know, if you see uh, Edina fall downstairs two or three times, you think, oh, hooray, or maybe you think, oh, gosh, she's doing it again. Um, there she goes, falling down. You know, there's something repetitious about comedy, but not immediately repetitious. Right. So, in other words, I think, although I think comedy needs to be given more of a chance, maybe, than drama, but I can see that drama is a quicker and easier... uh, There is a quicker and easier chance that it'll be successful. So it's more... The, maybe it's a generational thing that our, my generation is quite instant gratification-y, which means, that's not a real word, but I'm going to go with it. Um, <laughs> but we, we do like our instant gratification and we like things yeah. quick. So I'm thinking, yes, but you, you also you like just, a laugh. Yeah, but, you yeah no, but what I'm saying is, if, you, no, but, hmm, if you've got a lot of drama programs that mean by the end of the show, I feel good, I can get on with my life and I don't have to watch another one if I don't want to kind of thing, that might be more appealing to the current audience that are watching TV than, uh, a, you know, sort of jump... Because I, I know, for example, that I don't invest... I don't... Tr- 
if I'm going to watch a new series of TV, I'll do it in September when I've got loads of free time. It's after Edinburgh and I can binge watch it if I enjoy it. I don't start watching it do you now. Know, that's why the autumn season yeah, I'm sure. starts when it does. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I imagined. Because, if, if, for example, I've had a friend of mine who keeps telling me to watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is a program in America. It's very good. It's very good. And now I'm stuck on it and I, and I keep watching it. No, I like it a lot. But it's so annoying because I don't want to get committed to a show th- at this point in the year. And it's annoying. Don't worry, it'll still be there in the autumn. Yeah, but I won't care because I want to watch it yes, now. Yes, you will. Because if you watch a I'll half watch it again. hour, yeah. at the end of which you feel, oh, hooray, that was nice. That yeah, well, I binge watch. Yeah, but, um, yeah. but my, my, my point is, how, well, it's a combination of questions, but I suppose it's how is the technology changing the way that shows are being made and when they're well, being produced? I think, as well the as, big, uh, I think the big change is numeric. The big change is that there's more stuff than there ever was and therefore it's you know I am old enough to remember a time when there was BBC One and BBC now I can remember BBC Two starting but that, all right there was BBC One and then there was ITV <gasps> hooray and ITV was a bit more down market of the BBC and the result of that was it pulled the BBC a tiny bit down market that was the sort of the way things went and then uh, BBC Two came along, and then Channel Four came along, and then God knows how many other channels came along. So it's harder, you know, the, it, when you start. Uh, sorry, at the when there are a small number of channels, it's easier to get an audience to the, to those channels, even the ones that aren't as good as the other ones. When there are seven channels or when there are 70 channels, it's hard. Because why, why are you going to watch that at that time and not that other thing? Answer, because, uh, uh, well, the answer used to be because that's all that's on. But if, it's, if there are seven other things, it, you know, it's harder. That's really what I'm saying. But also there's, I, I suppose... And I apologise for being in our take it. Carry on. <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to edit. It's going to sound really great. Thank God. Um, <laughs> but did you just think this is going straight out the door? Um, no, but uh, I think collective viewing experiences still happen, but just intermittently depending on the event. But you say collective viewing experience slightly as if it's a collective thing. I don't think it's about about a group of people deciding they want to watch something. I think it's just that more and more people end up watching something because they've heard it's quite good. You watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I've watched Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Suddenly that show is sort of in the comedy, you know, furniture. Mm. Can, it be, can you be in furniture? Anyway, uh, it on the furniture. <laughs> it, it's part of yeah. the comedy television furniture. But... It started in Britain relatively obscurely, and it took a while. Witness the fact that you can now see, if you want to sit down and binge watch, three series all one one after the other. Mm. And that wouldn't have happened in the old days because there wouldn't have been three series available. No, no. I think it's I think stuff like iPlayer and Netflix have yeah. made it and make a big difference, cheaper and easier yes. for you to yeah. to watch and be, and if. Only Fools and Horses started now, mm. give or take, it would probably have a bit of an easier time because it wouldn't be so long between Series 1 and Series 2 and Series 3 and, and the time at which everybody said, this is the best thing on telly. Mm. So in your, in your time of, of producing shows... When you, uh, well, tell you what, you can pick a specific example, or we can just give a general example. Okay. Say, say you're, you know, you're sat in your office in in television centre, wherever it is, yeah. uh, and well, when in you the were, days when there were desks and okay. chairs in television set. Sorry, carry on. That's all right. So, okay, we'll we'll paint a picture for people. Ten years ago, you sat in a television centre at a desk, and it got a chair. And it's got a chair, it's got a telephone, and you, it's got all and the a secretary outside. Now, none of those things. Anyway, carry anyway, on. So, and, and you need to make a show, because yeah. that's your job. Yeah. Right. Do you put a call out to agents and say, we're after ideas? Or do you, people send you in scripts? Do, especially at this point, well, you're, you're freelancing? Well, it's a bit of everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
if you're the head of a department, what happens is roughly as follows. The day you walk in the door, there probably are already, you know, let's say three series in various stages, either of being on air and another series is coming, or being about to be on air and being good enough to get, you know. So so there's a sort of, uh, there's a certain amount that's already given. So what do you do then? You sit down and you talk to some people and some people talk to you and you look <laughs> for new things. And, and those new things may be, well, for example, when I started working uh, as what was initially called head of broken comedy and then I decided that being head of anything that was broken was probably a bad idea and I became a head of I think comedy entertainment right. who cares uh, anyway when that happened the alternative comedy boom whatever that is or was meant that we I probably didn't think now I must work you know I must work out what to do with the best club comedians that are around. You know, that, that area had gone out of fashion, so I wasn't looking to do that. And anyway, the entertainment department were doing little and large, so, you know, so I'm, I'm looking at a world that has Alexi Sale and Dawn French and Rick Mail and Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry, you know, that, that's the world we're working in. And to a certain extent, what you do is you invite those people in and you give them a cup of tea or coffee and you say, is there anything you want to do? Uh, and they say, mm, no. And so you <laughs> say, well, it would be nice if, yeah. uh, you know, a conversation happens. But and, thank you for and, the coffee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, we're not. And anyway, we don't want to work for the BBC. Um, <laughs> No, so a certain amount is working with them. A certain amount is going to them with an idea because, I don't know, this is, this is a quick example. I knew in 2010 that the Olympic Games were scheduled to happen in 2012 in the UK. And, and I thought it would be a shame if we don't do something mildly amusing. And so, aim I high. sorry, <laughs> aim high, <laughs> yeah, Hardly. aim high, yeah, <laughs> go under the, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Go for just and so I rang the only person I could think of at the time who knew uh, how to play football, and that was a man called John Morton because he played five aside football every Wednesday. Uh, as apparently, I seem to remember, did John Burt, but anyway, let's not bother. So I said to John, What do you think? Is there, do you think there's anything? to be done and and there was a bit of a legal nightmare between us and an Australian bunch of people who suddenly thought that I was asking them to do that I was asking some Australians to do a show about the London Olympics which would have been fairly insane anyway 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 the long and the short is John went off and wrote 2012 so so in other words a bit like I don't know 15 years earlier, Richard had thought, I want to do the Vicar of Dibley because it's about that, you know, it's that time. I want to do that. Uh, sometimes shows are occasional. Mm. Uh, sometimes, you know, we did The Office and it was very successful and Ricky did what Ricky th did throughout his career or does throughout his career, which is he did The Office for the BBC and then he immediately went off and did a live show for Channel 4 because he believed that he, or his agent believed, that he should spread himself fairly wide. Um, anyway. And then he came back and said, you know, I've had this thought, and we want to do extras. And so, you know, you'd be insane if you stood in his way. I don't mean that you don't add to the idea or at least talk the idea through, but, but it's a good idea. Mm. So, so things happen in different ways. Mm. But it... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to ask a follow-up question to that, but I don't feel like Go it's... Go on. Um, well, <laughs> I'll see if I can. Singers are already here. Yeah. Well, um, it, it's kind of an offshoot to what you just said, where you said that your title changed 
and and I know that you've also been head of co- uh, head of comedy. Oh, but it was only just. I mean, when you say, when I say my title change, what I mean is the bit of paper on the front on the yeah. door of my office changed. That was all. Does it? Yeah, I was going to ask whether these titles meant anything at the be- in terms <laughs> of you or. Uh, Disgust. Does your job mean anything? No, it's um, like just the time. I know what you mean. <laughs> I know, I know what you mean. But we um, I tell you, minute. okay, uh, what I think, as far as I remember, it went like this. When uh, I'd known a guy called David Liddermont at Granada, and we'd worked a bit together on various things, he then came into the BBC as... I think he was head of everything. No, he wasn't. He was head of entertainment, which was entertainment and comedy. And and he knew me, and so he said, you know, do you fancy coming in and doing uh, comedy entertainment, which which essentially meant um, shows that weren't mainstream sketch shows. Poor old, uh, no, that's not fair. Jeffrey Perkins, um, who I say poor old because he had the tougher job, uh, he had the tougher job of trying to provide mainstream comedy hits for BBC One. And sometimes that meant uh, controllers deciding that the only thing to do was to do as little comedy as possible because then the risks were slightly less, I suppose, and sometimes it meant, and it seems to me that this is the better idea, but what do I know, uh, that people said, well, look, if it's tough to get hits with comedy, we'll just do as many as we can, and if some stick to the wall, hooray. And and it seems to me that that's a sort of better idea, really, you know, just to do as much as you can and see what works. <laughs> I know. It's that's pretty much my career up to date. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And Look how well that's going. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you scout for new talent then? Like when you're when you're trying to find people that would go into shows or into ideas, do you, do you go do you go to Edinburgh to the festival? Do you go to comedy clubs? What's your? I don't go to Edinburgh anymore, but that's just because I'm a lazy git. I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> and there's enough people in Edinburgh. It mm. seems to me. Just physically, mm. there are enough people, um, even when there isn't a festival. Anyway, you've not seen uh, my venue, my room. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, how do we scout for new people? Well, um, one way is you see somebody and you just go, you know, you hear about people. People, are, you people, agents ring you up and say, "I want you to come and see." Actually, that was how I very first saw Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders. Is Their agent rang up and said, "Come to this. What was it, had in fact, I think, been a mortuary in Hampstead, uh, which was known at that point of its life as the New End Theatre, Hampstead." Uh, come and see these two girls because I think they're jolly good. And I went and saw them, and they were doing sketches. And I have to say, the audience was jolly tolerant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, the audience was very tolerant, and I thought they're 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 rather good. And and as a result, I I think I went to see them because at the time I was producing Wogan Terry Wogan's three times a week chat show, and there was talk about whether they would be on. Um, and uh, and so then a few years later when they'd done a couple of series but uh, had decided to go in a slightly different direction I was rung again and asked if I still could remember who they were hmm. <laughs> <laughs> sorry I, that doesn't answer your question which was I just asked how you were no, I'm um, <laughs> My, my question oh, I'm looking for people. Time, yeah. yeah. So, so you get Dawn and Jennifer, and yeah. then Dawn and Jennifer say, "I tell you who we want to have in this sketch because she's jolly good," and that's I don't know Harriet Thorpe or Helen Ledra. And so some people come in then, and although I don't remember it at the beginning of my career, I'm sure it existed. You employ casting directors. There were the, there's a there was a lovely lady called Tracy Gillum who had an office uh, on the comedy floor of the BBC. Desks? Very, no, rubber shoes, really. Big (laughs) rubber shoes. 
Um, and she was a casting director, and she had, there was a lady called Joe Buckingham with her. You know, there, and, and there was another lady called Rachel. You know, there were lots of people, mm. not lots, but there were two or three people who were casting directors. And, and I, because I started in the theatre, uh, and with a, at the Royal Court, where there was a rather wonderful casting director called Patsy Pollock, who was, I think the expression ballsy would do, uh, about choosing actors. Um, it's good to be able to go and just talk to somebody and say, is there somebody who can do this? And and you end up with, as it were, as we did with In Beautiful People, with um, Olivia Coleman and with, and with Tracy saying, get her while you can. <laughs> but is... So, 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 the answer to your question is... You see people, you get told about people, people tell you about their friends, uh, you hear about people, agents ring you, t- casting directors tell you, it's a mixture. It's a case of being in the general zeitgeist yeah. at the right time in yeah. the right place. Yeah. So there's no real formula for it, really. But I don't think there is. And neither do I think in a way that there should be. I no. think it, it should be of... Meritocracy. Exactly. Yeah. Or something. Or yeah. whatever that word is. Yeah. No, it should be a meritocracy and it should be a varied meritocracy. Definitely. Well, my, my follow-up question to that is where... I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't cynically say, if, you, if you're listening to agents, surely they've got a vested interest in someone they've taken on and they've got their own business reasons for taking on certain clients. Yeah, but I think you learn pretty quickly who the agents are who are ringing you up just because they want that client and, and to keep that client, let's say, uh, and the others who are good and ring you up because they think the person's right and the good ones know that you pick your moment you don't ring too early you know you don't ring me or somebody like me and say there's this girl who's just come out of Rada and she's really really good and you should see her they may be wait wait a year and see how she's doing before they ring me because they know they haven't got many shots at it Mm. so you learn, and also the people you're dealing with learn. Mm. I read a quote in the Telegraph, which I don't know. I never uh, quite believe quotes. Well, well done actually. for reading the Telegraph. <laughs> Sorry, it was, it was a friend's account. I didn't pay for the. But um, okay, good. Uh, I don't know. I don't believe quotes unless I see the person or, or like. And was it, it about me? Yeah, it was oh something you God, said. What did I it was say? Something you said. Dear God. Uh, you Go said on. you could look at everything I produced over the last few years. <laughs> And analyze it as a very sick man who has a very sick, sad sense of humor and the, uh, and lives a tragic life surrounded by very dominant women. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. Was that real? Can I ask you to tell me what year that was? Oh, I think it was about five, six years ago. Was it? Hell? Yeah. It was about 25 or well, 26. Well, I think they no, might have it rehashed the, an it An interview. Then. Oh, was it? Okay. They might, no, well, it, was, it was a collection of the, the top <laughs> the same 100 to, people who are the most oh, know, influential. Okay. So I know at one point I was voted 25th most important person in British. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> You were further down the list than this one. Oh, yeah. well, no, I'm joking. Well, okay, <laughs> do what all comedians do. The are one you, time they get five stars, they just always say it was five stars. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. I lower than 25? I, no, I don't remember. Yeah. Okay. I could look it up. Carry on. Oh, okay. sorry. You were asking me, am I a sad, tragic person? <laughs> uh, I've asked you if you worth anything and if you're a sad man. No. Well, look, I would say that I think since... Well, okay. At the time that I was to- saying that, mm. I think I was mostly doing either French and Saunders mm. or Abfab uh, or Dibley. And you could say that I was... Uh, no, I wasn't dominated by them at all because they were they were wonderful and 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 we got on very well. So mm. what you see there is my sad and pathetic attempt at at a joke, which in cold print looks useless. But anyway, did, did uh, read as time went on, I would say that, for example, the work we did with. Um, with John Morton on People Like Us and 2012 and uh, W1A, 
tended to be slightly more male dominated mm. so and the office was fairly male dominated mm. thank god it wasn't entirely but you know so so i've done a bit with both totally well, <laughs> and, yeah. and and in and, the middle and in the middle not I was just, say not just you've covered all i have but what i was going to say was uh there's obviously talks of quotas and demographics especially at the bbc of like having like a woman on panel shows and all, all these kind of um i think i think mystic Misconceptions and rumours of things that channels are doing to add diversity I think and equality. May, actually. May. Sorry, <laughs> that, Carry she, on. she was great. And uh, but I was wondering what your thoughts on quotas and I don't think it's true. You don't think they're happening? Well, I think they happen, but I don't think they happen in the sense of somebody doing my job is rung up by somebody above me. You know, I don't think the head of BBC One or the managing director of television or anybody rings somebody like me and says uh you've got too many women in leads in your show you should get a few men what happens is there's a general feeling that you want a wide range of stuff you know it would be insane not to you know it'd be silly to just have like you said you want to produce yeah as much you as want to see what's exactly yeah. so so i i distinctly remember there was a guy called anil gupta who came into my office uh, just when i'd started and said why aren't there any asian sketch shows on telly uh give me some money he said <laughs> which people usually said when they came into my office uh, give me some money and I'll show you that there are some people out there who should be doing a show. And so I did, and and it led to, goodness gracious me. Mm. Now, uh, I, it, it wasn't because I got a, a memo from <laughs> on high that said, please could you encourage somebody to come into your office and talk about an Asian sketch show. There's just a zeitgeisty thing that mm. says there ought to be some more, you know, you, you've gone a bit short on doors. Mm. <laughs> that caught me. I don't mean place. that. Please but, edit that out. Uh, no, I'm leaving that in. Um, we did Psychoville, and that contained lots of doors. Anyway, so I yeah, I enjoyed Psychoville. I, I thought it was amazing. Um, uh, so wh- why did you laugh at that? Well, no, I, because just because it's it's in a way not good to remember Psychoville because of the numbers of doors. Uh, well, that, although never, it did have quite a few. I never understood that as if I when uh, for me that was one of my favorite things for the last sort of 15 20 years oh. I thought it was outstanding I thought it blended genres together well, very well okay well there's an instance of recent Steve uh who knows whatever happened to Mark Gatiss but recent Steve came in and said we want to do something that's a bit more narrative Mm-hmm. We want to sort of do a series, a, a, a series, a, a, a horror series, essentially, was what they said. And so, uh, you know, they talked about it and we talked about it and, and, and Psychoville was what, was what came out and, and it was a joy and it was partly a joy because the League of Gentlemen uh, hadn't had any other p- actors in it much. I mean, that not in not in the main parts mm. uh, when it when it was on. And so suddenly we were ringing people up and who were saying, "You want me to work with the general?" Oh yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, and and they were and, and the story was was a very good and solid. Um, who done it kind of thing. Well, it was both a who done it and a. Um, who's it from? Mm. You know, it was six people who each got a letter mm. saying, "I know what you did," mm. and that was that's a great first premise. Mm. Yeah. Um, for me, the and it may tell you about about me, but for me, the first episode was most memorable for the moment when Steve runs into the hotel dining room and he's playing a, a man who isn't necessarily as mentally uh on top of things as he might be and he runs in and he says come quick come quick we've been another murder and it, this is a, a notionally a, 
a sort of murder mystery weekend thing in our head. Come quick, come quick, it's been another murder. And then everybody runs through to another room where he said, look, look, the murderer has written his or her name on the black... Uh, I'll start again. Well, let me get the words right or Steve will kill me. He's, ri- he's written fuck pig in the... Uh, in exactly. his own excrement. He's written the word fuck pig in his or her own excrement. And <laughs> and you ask yourself at the time, is that comedy? Uh, is you know what's funny? Written about that? down. Will we get away with that? Is yeah. actually what I thought. So, being a uh, you know a, a fully paid up member of the BBC, I knew that if I got in early next morning and had a look at the BBC duty log, and the BBC duty log is the thing where I rate. People from Tunbridge Wells and various other places uh, ring up and say, "What, a, a dear, oh dear, oh dear, take this off my telly! What do you people think you're doing?" And I was absolutely sure that a slightly mentally challenged boy saying he's written "fuck pig" in his or her own excrement, uh, and indeed seeing it. Uh, on BBC Two just after 10 o'clock of an evening would bring out a few um, uh, nays- let us yeah. say naysayers yeah. uh, or worried folk not a bit of it I was entirely wrong I got in and I looked up 10 o'clock BBC Two uh, Psychoville and there was one complaint and the complaint was as follows didn't say dear BBC, but it might as well. Dear BBC, do your researchers do no work at all? Does nobody bother to check that Bristol is not in the county of Avon? It is its own county. And this was because we'd done a caption, a lower frame super, that said that one of the characters lived in Bristol, comma, Avon. Now, we were wrong, and I hugely apologise to every citizen of Bristol and to the person who wasn't offended by fuck pig, but was offended by the fact that we'd misplaced Bristol. And uh, But it tells you something about A, the output, and B, the British public. It's... <laughs> I don't know what it says. No, neither do I. But it says fuck ping in his or her own Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly stunned by their uh, sort of French, uh, not French, sort, sort of ab fab level of just ignoring something and just going with what matters to them more than anything else. If that what do you sense. mean ignoring? As, it, as, ignoring in, as in just being so in their own little world that they're focused on what, just, just where their city is rather than... Oh, I see. Yes, yes, yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, the people of Bristol are proud of where they live. Avon. They're very and Avon. they know that they're not in Avon. Even well, if, who, uh, who would want to be from Avon? Really? Exactly. That's what we're saying. Um, Shakespeare, perhaps. Uh, I don't on. think he wanted to be from there. I no, think he, travel and limitations. indeed he left it fairly yeah. early on. Travel limitations. Carry on. <laughs> um, well, my, my next question was going to be literally just about uh, PC culture. Which kind of builds us in nicely to that. He's a very good policeman. I've always liked his work. Sorry, it's PC right. culture. P- and and what that reminds me it? of the joke from their PC world with the with the uh, punks and Judy. Oh yes. Yeah. Now we just pl- now this is nostalgia. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wonder what you think of PC culture. What you think of uh, when you were in a position where you had to make decisions? I tried very very hard to ignore it. Okay. Uh, because. I don't know, because it didn't seem to me that my job was to censor stuff, or at least to censor it just because of some outside idea that I didn't fully understand. Now, uh, this may be a good or a bad example of this. We recently did a reunion show with the League of Gentlemen, uh, which... Uh, contained a story involving a character called Pop. Pop is, I think, perhaps Lebanese, but certainly from that sort of neck of the woods. And his son uh, runs a delicatessen. And Pop has been in prison for a while and now comes out and feels that his son is a bit of a wuss. And he wants... 
uh, he wants, as it were, revenge on his son. I think he thinks, I can't remember the details of the story and I should, uh, I think he thinks that his son was responsible for him being in prison in the first place. Anyway, he arrives in the delicatessen and he informs his son that, uh, I think what he actually says is, do you know what this is? And the son says, yes, it's a, it's a um, picnic bar of chocolate. Uh, and it's a picnic bar because he, in the earlier series, it had been a chocolate bar called Maverick. But, but as is as is uh, discussed, Maverick bars are Maverick chocolate bars aren't made anymore. And Pop tells us that he's going to put as many uh, picnic bars as he can up his son's. I think it's described as up his son's shithole. A ship pipe, I apologize. Uh, up his son's ship pipe. And uh, yeah, clearly a look of fear comes into his son's eyes. Now, I was, uh, we were filming this and I happened to be there. And the producer told, I was the exec producer, who cares, but, but the producer said, I've had a note from editorial policy about this, who feel that we are giving undue prominence to um, picnic bars. And they want us to disguise, I think, I can't remember, it was a disguise the label or don't mention them or something. Now, it seems to me that as a relatively logical human being, um, not regularly in the habit of putting picnic bars uh, in the aforementioned ship pipe, that, that, the makers of Picnic are not particularly going to go, ooh, hooray, look at the wonderful advert that these guys from Royston Basie are giving us. Because the, the, you know, what he's intending to do is not giving undue prominence to a picnic bar. Indeed, he's telling us that he's about to not give undue prominence to a picnic bar. So I said, look, we can't, no, don't do that. You know, forget the... Now, I'm not blaming the producer at all. I think the producer would have would have quite gone, you know, we'd have arrived there without me saying that. But but I, the, the, I, I suppose that was a PC thing. That was somebody in the BBC saying, or, or that was somebody in the BBC reading the script, firstly reading the script not in a funny voice, reading the script not really kind of knowing what the scene would look like and why should he have and not I don't know it looked it just seemed to me the wrong call mm. and so we we ignored it and I suspect if somebody in the end had said you've given undue prominence to the makers of picnic bars uh, we would have done something though god knows what uh, we would have very expensively painted out uh, the wrapping when yeah. he did it. There was another instance. Wh well, I don't know whether this, this isn't necessarily P PC or RC or something. There was an, goodness gracious me, became very successful. Uh, thank God. And there was, a, there were a couple on it called the Coopers. Uh, and they were um, Asian, uh, two Asian couples who wanted to sort of outdo each other with being more English than the English. And it was a nice sort of reversal idea. And there was a sketch involving them, which involved them going to church and taking Holy Communion. And uh, I think Mira's character had also brought along dip so that the wafer which is uh, the body of Christ, uh, could be dipped into uh, a nice, I don't know, lime, something or other. Uh, and the wine which you're given in communion, uh, somebody, uh, one of the other characters had brought along his own uh, rather larger bottle. Uh, anyway, anyway, anyway. So this went out on a Friday night on... BBC Two, and it got quite a lot of objection. Uh, and 
I can see that if you if you're a believing Christian, then the communion is sort of at the center of your uh, belief. And although I wouldn't, I mean, I can construct an argument that says, but that's not what really is being laughed at here. What's being laughed at are these couples who are trying wrongly to uh, out, to, you know, out English the English. But but anyway, um, I got a call because it was going to be repeated on a Sunday night, and I got a call from the then controller of BBC One who said, "Do you think you could?" I think maybe, no, is it possible to maybe cut this out? And it just seemed to me it's always dangerous when people say, particularly, you know, there's a longer argument that's to do with the Asian community have their own beliefs and the Christian community have their beliefs and are we saying that one superimposes over another or something? Anyway, 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 to cut a long story short, I rang the producer and, and told him of the phone call that I'd had from the control of BBC One, and we talked about was it possible to not to cut it out completely, but to do an edit that made it slightly less offensive. And I think we did do that. And whether that's, I don't know, I I don't think that's political correctness, but it may be belief awareness or belief correctness or something. But you know, television. Uh, some of us who make it, I suspect, sometimes forget that it goes into quite a lot of homes. Um, maybe slightly fewer homes than it used to because the others are watching Netflix mm. uh, and are watching Brooklyn Nine Nine and Stranger Things. But hey, uh, still not got around to that one. What? Uh, no, it's quite good. It's all right. It looks um, all right. Well, uh, Twitter's obviously a really big focal point for people to have conversations online about things they like and dislike so i'm told yeah i take it from that comment that you don't no i do actually and i do partly because it just seems a good way i mean this sounds horrible but it seems like a good way of just putting yourself out there a bit and when you've got a book coming out it's a it's a good thing to do for the publisher to say i promise i'll put myself out there as much as possible yeah <laughs> But when you're when you're putting shows out, especially yes. in the last few years, when Twitter's become more of a place where people will share yes. those opinions, and actually I mean, quite interesting. Am I allowed? Sorry, go I, ahead. I don't mean to shout you up. It's, it's, um, this is about you. It's not about me. No, it's about <laughs> Inside Number Nine. Inside Number oh, Nine, as you know, is a a show that usually has some sort of a twist. Is it the stats uh, about not tweeting during? Yeah. Yes, I saw that. Extraordinary that that the BBC had monitored. Uh, inside number nine, because yeah. because the audience for inside number nine mm -hmm. is a kind of Twitter literate mm -hmm. uh, bunch, and normally through television programs, doesn't matter really what they are, they tweet in a kind of uh, computerized version of Gogglebox. So they say, "What was he in? Oh yeah, he was in that thing. Oh my God, look at that! Oh, you know, there's a lot of that goes on on Twitter during a program." And interestingly, they shut up when Inside Number mm. Nine's on, and then Twitter like mad at the very end when the twist arrives. Yeah. Oh my God, I didn't see that coming. Well, I, I so my, my day job, I write jokes for Twitter for, well for brands and people and stuff. And I have worked for like you, you know Discovery for TV. For brands and for brands. Like, oh, you know, brands. You know, like I'm brands sorry. that are on Twitter or people. It, oh, they're all paying okay. me. I'll do it for. Right. Really but if you're listening, you write me some games. Oh yeah, I'll carry on. Yeah, it's fine. But when, <laughs> I, but when but when I work for TV channels, writing their tweets. Yeah. A lot of the time they would say, we really want have con to have conversation during the show. We really want it to trend. Like we want the hashtag to trend. And I kept saying, but then they're not watching what you spent a lot of money <laughs> making. It just seems ridiculous. And I remember seeing those statistics and, and I've worked with a TV channel since. And it was the first thing I said. I was like, well, do you like this program? Look how much better it is that they're talking about it after you've, you know. After they've watched it. Yeah. After, <laughs> after yeah, they've let them watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tweet. yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know is the answer. I mean, some shows feel like they're chewing gum for the eyes and therefore <laughs> if you're doing one thing with your eyes and another thing with your hands, that's fine. <laughs> I suppose. That's no, fine. fine. No, let's not go there. Okay. Um, quick, last quick fire questions. Go on. Um, they're quick for me. Take as long okay. as you like to answer. I have a buzzer. Okay. 
Um, what is the biggest mistake you've ever made and how did you overcome it? What's the biggest mistake I ever made? Um, where do we want to go with this? Uh, <laughs> well, the biggest mistake I suppose I ever made was that the very first programme I produced, which I produced for Granada Television, was banned by the <laughs> IBA. So I'd it's say that constitutes a, a pretty big mistake. And why was it banned? Uh, it's a relatively long story, but it, star- it, was, co- it was called uh, An Evening with Doris Stokes. Doris Stokes was a clairaudient. A clairaudient is someone who hears the dead from the other side and, and relates to us on this side what the dead are telling her. And it seemed to me quite a good idea for a television program. And, and Granada were at the time looking to do sort of edgy late night things. And I knew the guy who was promoting her around the country and so we constructed this program which was Doris bringing back the dead and then 25 spiritualists 25 punters and 25 um, psychology students from the University of Manchester Uh, because I thought hooray hooray that they'll say this is mind you know this is playing with our minds, this is nonsense, or, you know, whatever they would say. They were more enthusiastic about the dead coming back than anybody. They wanted, you know, they wanted their budgie back. Mm. They wanted their auntie back. You know, and it, and it was hosted uh, or adjudicated maybe by a man called Roger Royal, the Reverend Roger Royal, uh, who was a Church of England reverend and used to quite regularly appear on a thing called Pause for Thought on Terry Wogan's morning show. Anyway, anyway, it was a relatively camp old festival. Well, no, it was a good festival of something or other in which uh, the dead came back and, and oh, lovely, oh, he's coming back with so much love. Uh, anyway, a lot of that went on. And then um, I got a phone call from... The Sun newspaper. Now, at the time, the Sun newspaper, I think, wasn't owned by Rupert Murdoch, but it was still a relative. I should have known better, but I didn't. Anyway, I was rung up by the Sun, and they said, now we hear you're doing a program with Doris Stokes. Um, can you tell us anything about it? And I said, well, you know, obviously, it's just a local program, just going out in the Northwest. I can't, you know, so I'm sure you won't be able to do much on it, but... It's quite interesting because the dead come back, uh, as, as it were. And they said, well, I'm not sure we'll be able to do very much on it, but, you know, we might be able to give it a paragraph. Uh, and then they immediately put the phone down. I think the man was called Derek. Anyway, Derek put Corn? the phone... Uh, no, I don't <laughs> think... Derek put the phone down and rang Doris and said, Granada are very worried about your show. Nothing I had said implied that in any way, shape, or form, and indeed should have been the opposite. So Doris then gave them a lot of defensive, I'm a good girl, I am, I don't mean no harm to anybody, I don't. Um, she didn't particularly talk like it, I said do little, but anyway. Um, so she gave them some defensive quotes. They then re- rang a well-known anti-spiritualist priest who said, if uh, God was going to bring the dead back, he wouldn't do it on a chat show. Now, we might discuss, I think, at some length, whether he would do it on a chat show, but anyway. So, this led to, and I can't remember, it was like a week later, full page in the sun that said, horror chat show storm. Uh, you know, the dead come back, priests up in arms, you know, whatever. And... Horror Chat Show Storm led to the IBA, which was the sort of governing body of ITV at the time, mm. saying, we, we need to see this program, and seeing it and not quite knowing what to do with it. And so sending it down to London to the IBA there, who didn't know what to do with it. So they sent it to the guy who was the head of the IBA at the time, and he, didn't, he said he, a conversation was had between him and between Granada and the IBA. And they decided uh, again it. Uh, 
Uh, even though I later found out that the chairman of the IBA, I think at the time, and forgive me if this is wrong and or libelous, was the chairman of Capital Radio, who uh, gave Doris a two-hour slot, phone-in slot, every Wednesday evening on Capital. Anyway, 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 my first program was pulled. I got a phone call from Mike Scott, who was the program controller at the time, who said, I'm sorry, it's not going to go out, but... Um, you know, look at it this way. If your first program is pulled, you'll probably end up as program controller. Well, I didn't, but <laughs> it didn't matter too much. Sorry. No. Okay. No. There's a quick fire. There's a quick fire. <laughs> Go on. Um, who do you think is the most underrated person in the TV industry? Me. <laughs> no. Uh, who's <laughs> fair? <laughs> no, it's not. It's just... Okay. Mm, it's a good question. Who's the... Uh, narrow it down a tiny bit. Do you mean performer or well, producer? I, I, no or I normally keep it quite open on purpose, but if we said one behind the scenes, one in front of the camera? I mean, it doesn't narrow it down, does it? That's basically me giving you categories. <laughs> that's, that's basically me saying, well, how about if I just split it and then you can pick one of each? Um, All right. Um, I will pick... Um, and, and actually, he's not underrated, so this is, in a way, not answering your question, but Hugh Skinner, who plays Will in W1A, I think he's very good and very funny, and happens also to be, so I'm told, in the new um, Mamma Mia horror fest that oh. is uh, currently in cinemas up and down the land. Okay. Uh, he's jolly good. And his character... Uh, I don't know whether I should be careful telling this story, but but there was a, part of part of that character comes from a conversation I had with a personnel person at the BBC a long time ago, who told who said I've just had this extraordinary encounter with a producer who'd had an intern uh, for I think fifteen months without paying the intern. And when uh, was co the, per the producer was confronted and they said, look, you, you know, you can't do this. Uh, she said, oh, no, it's okay. He's my cousin. <laughs> Which is sort of mm. nepotism and wrong on so many levels. Uh, sorry, what was it? so underrated on screen, Hugh, not that he is, but he's jolly good. Um, underrated off screen. Well, I... Uh, he again. Uh, uh, I was going to say John Morton because he's a genius, and and he's only underrated. He's sort of underrated by himself, really. Uh, I mean, I think anybody who's ever seen people like us or WNA or Twenty Two or whatever knows how good he is and how good he is at a particular thing. And the particular thing he's good at is apparently, so I'm told, called phatic language. Emphatic language is a thing we all do, which is how we say nothing. We talk, but don't really say anything. You see, the thing is, what I mean, well, what I mean is, I mean, I, obviously, you know, I don't want to go into this, but what I really mean is, you know, that's phatic. That's yeah. filling in a gap before saying anything. Mm. And it's what his characters do rather well. And, and to write it is... I would imagine hugely difficult. Yeah, yeah. But he does. So well done him. Uh, last question. And Reese Shearsmith. I'd say Reese Shearsmith is hugely underrated because he keeps telling me that he is. <laughs> 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 no, that's not fair. He's b bloody good as well. Fair enough. Last question. If you, could, if you could go back and give yourself one bit of advice just as you're starting your career on TV, what would you have liked to have known? Don't work in television. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on. That's all right. That was John. His take on the connection between the Edinburgh Fringe and the TV industry, as well as how viewing figures have dropped and how the industry has had to adapt to that change, along with his advice for new and upcoming writers and performers, was so inspiring to me. 
as someone who has been working on a few scripts for a while and a few idea based things I don't know how to describe them they're like shorts I suppose I really found this inspiring to put together and I really found it motivating to try and get some more of them finished so I can't thank him enough for his time and I really appreciate everything that he had to offer as I said before John actually has a new book out called How to Produce Comedy Bronze there's a link in the show notes it's an affiliate link I get about 10p from every book doesn't cost you any more so if you could use that link please do it really helps out the show because it gives me a small but if everyone did it donation and also it helps out the guest because obviously they put a lot of time and effort into creating a book to help you learn more about the industry if you'd like to thank either me or john please do check out our twitter handles in the show notes of the podcast or you can search for them if you don't want to do it that way however you want to do it please do thank the guest if you've got something out of the podcast even if it's one nugget of information it really helps because then they know there are people listening and there's an audience here and it means when i ask them if for an introduction to someone else they're supportive of that so if you can help please do it really helps out the show also tweeting me really helps me out because there's a lot of editing that goes into these shows and a little bit of community support never ever doesn't go a long way so thank you very much for any of those messages if you like this episode you might also like my interview with chris sussman from bbc studios we were talking about the commercial wing of the bbc or you might enjoy my interview with mark talbot head of comedy at hattrick productions we spoke about indie production houses and how they scout for new talent and ideas there's so many episodes you can go through in the back catalogue of this podcast if you're interested in tv or writing for tv please go and check it out if you're new here please do remember to hit the subscribe button if you're old here please do remember to give us an honest ideally positive review in itunes and either way please do consider giving us a donation to keep the project going uh, as i said a minute ago about 18 hours 15 to 18 hours go into every single episode of this podcast you can donate from as little as one pound or a dollar if you go on patreon do you think this is worth a quid can you afford to help me keep doing this i'd really appreciate it you can do it at simonkane.co.uk via paypal or you can do it via patreon from one dollar an episode that's 80p it's really not a lot of money and i understand if you can't afford it but if you've got 80p twice a month to support this show please do please do donate no matter how small or big your donation all of it helps the ask the industry podcast is a fruit that got in gravity's way production for the internet all elements were created by me comedian simon kane thank you very much for listening thank you very much for subscribing and thank you very much for rating and donating if you do i'll see you all in about 14 days time bye